We'd like to thank Jesus Hernandez and our panelists from the Tourism Without Barriers session. It allowed us to reflect about on how leisure, tourism and recreation play a very important role in guaranteeing the full and effective inclusion of people with disabilities in all areas of life. We really admire their work and without a doubt, we will be following them and helping them generate more opportunities for growth. To continue with our program today, we'd like to invite you to take part in this very special program, ICT Innovation for Inclusion. It's a joint program that's been developed with Pacto de Productividad Chile, the Innovation Lab of the IADB, Fundación Descubreme, and Zero Project. The program looks to use technology to promote employment and improve the productivity of people with disabilities in the labor market. They've identified three initiatives that are highly innovative from Brazil, Spain and India that are now being replicated in Chile in both the public and private sector through three different organizations. After more than a year since their founding, we'd like to invite these guests to reflect on the lessons they've learned and the challenges they face. That's it, right, Maria Ignacia. This session will be moderated by Ingrid Rojas, the manager of Pacto de Productividad Chile, and we'll have the panelists Alejandra León, Henry Mejia from Fenescol, Guillermo Braga, the founder of Egalité, Inclusion and Diversity, and Paloma Cid from the Office of Universal Accessibility of Fundación Once, and finally, Williams Cuevas, from Fundación Luz, one of the partner organizations in Chile. We'd like to invite you to learn more about this interesting project. Sean todos muy bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Welcome everyone. My name is Ingrid Rojas, and I'm the manager of Pacto de Productividad Chile. Today I'm using a green blouse, I'm blonde and I'm using glasses. It's an honor to be here today, once again, moderating this conversation on ICT within the Zero Project Conference for Latin America 2022, and here in person after so much time. As you know, the ICT Innovation for Inclusion program is an initiative directed by the Pacto de Productividad Chile in alliance with the Zero Project and financed by IDB Lab. It's an initiative that seeks to identify and implement innovative solutions that facilitate the lab labor inclusion of people with disabilities in the open labor market. Right now, the prize winning initiatives of, of the ICD program from 2021, Egalité from Brazil, uh, Enable India and Fundación Once are in the final stage of their pilot project implementation with their partners in Chile. The Inter Inter National Institute for Rehabilitation, the National Employment Service and Fundación Luz. The aim of this conversation is to talk about the possible impacts that these initiatives might have so they can be re replicated in other organizations or in different contexts. To talk about these issues, we've invited several important panelists to tell us about their valuable experience in the matter. Today, we have Alejandra León, the director of the Pacto de Productiv Colombia, the, uh, Henry Mejia, the Director General of the National Federation for the Deaf of Colombia, FENASCOL, who look, seeks, which is an organization that seeks to defend the rights of the deaf through actions and programs that respond to their needs. We also have William Cuevas, the representative of the Fundación Luz, who is uh, talking about a program from Enable Italy or er, India. We have Guillermo Braga, from Igalité Brasil, a virtual platform for job search, and Paloma Cid, 
the coordinator of Fundacion Once Spain, who is responsible for an initiative that 3D prints supportive devices for improving workstations for people with disabilities. We'd like to talk to our representatives about these initiatives. First, we are going to talk with Henry and Alejandra. We'll talk about the impact of the use of their technologies and innovations on the lives of people with disabilities. We will talk about some of the difficulties and successes of the process. I would like to hear first from Alejandra, who will talk to Henry about some of the difficulties and challenges that they faced in their initiative. Welcome, Alejandra. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Henry. It's nice to see you again. And we know that Finescon is a movement for people with disabilities in Colombia. It has been working for 37 years now. And I would say thank you to Finescon. The community of the deaf in Colombia have a voice. Finescon has developed several important missions over the 37 years of history. Today, we're going to focus on one of the technological tools that is called Centro de Relevo. And I would like Henry to tell us a bit about the Centro de Relevo. How does it work? Thank you very much, Alejandra, for the introduction. And I'd like to send my greetings to everyone here today. It, is so nice to be participating in this space. Before answering your questions, I'd like to tell you a bit about the context in which we work, because the large number of people who work in different spaces for people with auditory disabilities think that the they think first about physical disabilities or difficulties in uh, incorporating yourself in the space. They don't think necessarily about the communication difficulties. And so Finesco has been working for all of these years to be able to allow the deaf community to be able to access communication. It's 21 years that we have been working on a project in alliance with the uh, institutes for communication and innovative technologies to provide more access to communication information. 20 years ago, the deaf community faced several barriers in terms of communication, in terms of telephone communication as well. If they want to communicate with other people, family members, uh, friends, companies, call their friends, they needed to use the telephone, but there was obviously a barrier that they had to overcome because a lot of people didn't understand uh, Colombian sign language. So we sought to provide a response to this issue so that the deaf community could access phone calls on the same footing as any of the population and they could participate in different spaces. In 2001, Centro de Relevo was founded, and we began with a tool for text by telephone, uh, TTY communication, that would allow the deaf community, because there wasn't enough knowledge at that point among the deaf community to be able to communicate uh, in Spanish due to educational barriers. So there were certain barriers that could be overcome via using sign language. For now, we've got things like WhatsApp that allow us to send a video using sign language. And so we can therefore use a telephone to communicate. Centro de Relevo has been able to guarantee access to communication over these 20 years, having a positive impact on the deaf community. Thank you very much, Henry. I'd like to ask you a second question, which is, 
Does the Centro de Relevo help the deaf people to access different sectors? They can use your services to uh, access medical services, to go to job interviews. Can you tell us a bit about the types of communication that you provide, how you've been able to help this community in terms of the services, the work that you've done, so that the Centro de Relevo now within the deaf community has been able to position itself as a bridge for communication. Okay, so the Centro de Relevo is very important for the deaf community. It allows us to to make calls to different people in different contexts, whether it's among the family, academic, in the job sector, medical calls, they can carry out all sorts of processes. They can do this with public and private sectors. Centro de Relevo in Colombia is a bridge for communication that's very important for the deaf community. In 2009 to 2011, we were able to make 4 million communications. We have been able to bridge these communications over the past 10 years for the deaf communities. The number of beneficiaries today are 58,900 deaf in Colombia who are able to access this tool. Many require sign language interpretation. And because there are no resources in Colombia that are sufficient so that the deaf can access, for example, a healthcare center or a notary. And so from 2009 to 2022, we were able to provide 158,000 uh, services of remote interpretation completely free to our user community. It is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including holidays. In fact, right now, the deaf community, when we carry out our analysis, we can see that the use of the Centro de Relevo, 36% of users use it for family communications or personal communications then 17% for personal communications, non-work oriented. We've got approximately the same dedicated to work communications. And then in terms of healthcare, education, business, and financial sector communications, we are building our percentages of use in those areas. But family communications is the most common use for our communications for the deaf community who are contacting with their family and need linguistic services to do so. The deaf community, for us, it, it, we're almost like foreigners in our own country because we use different language. So we need to eliminate these barriers to communication. Thank you very much, Henry. Now in Santiago de Chile, the Pacto de Productividad is expanding its technological solutions that will favor the incorporation of people with disabilities. From what we've heard, the Centro de Relevo in Colombia has been working for decades for the rights of people who are deaf. And we know that it's part of ministry and now everyone is aware of your service and so my last question is will the Pacto de Productiva of Chile be able to present some of the same technological solutions so that they can increase how can we increase the awareness of the program and make it sustainable so Henry what is the path that you've been able to take at Centro de Relevo Colombia so that your program can be sustainable? And so that you can talk about how your technological solutions, what can we do so that 
the pilot project that we've launched in Chile doesn't stop there. How can we make our pilot projects more sustainable? Yes, it's a very important question. It's true. Globally, we could say that 25 to 30 centers of the Centro de Relevo are functioning now, but it hasn't been easy. In Colombia, we were able to achieve it, but it was a lot of hard work along the way. And really, the, it was the law 324 that helped us in our country because it was the moment when sign language in Colombia was recognized in an official language, which has been so important for Fresco because that is when we were able to become, as part of the deaf community, we were able to raise awareness for our profile and work so that all of our rights were incorporated into the communication facilities in the country. We work with the ministry uh, so that in 2000, we are, our arguments were not recognized, but once this law was enacted, we became a benchmark reference via the ICT ministry. And that began as of 2001, when the ICT ministry finally began to uh, allocate resources. And that allowed us to get involved and raise the profile of the deaf community so that public policy could be directed towards our aims. And so we have been able to work based on different documents and laws that recognize the rights. And we've been working for the past 21 years. And it was only six to seven years ago that the minute we, we finally began to receive resources. And so that empowered the deaf, com deaf community. Because with these advances, we were able to make sure that we didn't have any negative uh, uh, setbacks. And so we were able to continue with our, our work thanks to the recognition of the Centro de Relevo, working within the framework of sustainability. We now have recognition by the government and we are considered within the legal framework. In Paraguay, they have already opened a Centro de Relevo uh, with our support. And so we have seen those expanded and now we are seeing that they're also recognized within the legal framework. So it's very important that the government takes this into consideration if they want to expand ICT technologies within their countries. Thank you. To close, I'd like to say that the Centro de Relevo is free for all deaf people. And I'd like to emphasize that it is an acquired right. And it has given a voice. And, a, and we need to push these initiatives that we are going to promote now in Chile so that people with disabilities can also access similar services and they can take possession of them themselves and feel empowered. So sustainability is also in the ma managing these organizations by people with disabilities themselves. And so congratulations on your initiative and uh, the best in the future. Thank you very much, Henry. Perfecto. Gracias a ustedes por la invitación. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It is important to give clarity to these aspects. People with disabilities should be able to empower themselves. It's These are the rights. Fenescol in this moment has a campaign that is related to the convention 
and the eighth article, eighth or ninth articles. It's uh, to be aware that's the eighth article, and we consider the focus on the uh, rights and also the article number nine is accessibility. And we have this campaign in this uh, federation where we say that without accessibility, there are no rights. This is the campaign we are promoting so entities change their perspective and they understand accessibility in a good way. Thank you so much for this space for all of us. That is very important. Muchas gracias, Henry, Alejandra. Thank you, Henry and Alejandra, for this interesting conversation. We were able to learn about the important impact of NSCOL in Colombia and other countries such as Paraguay. And we expect that these can uh, boost uh, and encourage the uh, community in different latitudes and to follow this example with all the things that you have achieved. Thank you so much because this is an inspiration for what we are going to see now with the three initiatives. We're going to continue talking about the impact these three initiatives have had. They have already had six months of uh, the pilots in Chile, and now we're going to hear uh, about them. First, William Cuevas, who is uh, the representative of Luz Foundation. He is going to tell us about how they have measured this, how they have complied with the indicators. What can you share with us about these uh, measurement after these six months of execution. Welcome, William. Thank you, Ingrid. For those who cannot see me, I'm wearing a dark uh, sweater. Uh, I'm a blind person. I have, um, I my hair is curly. And when I want to answer to your questions, I can tell you that in this project, that is the, this platform of cell learning for people with visual impairments. We have had different challenges. The first one is language. There are some things that have been delayed, but we have provided the feedbacks in order to progress on these as soon as possible. And in spite of this challenge, we continue to see some impacts of the tool that it had as we continue to discover the tool, among the impacts that we can consider, there are two types of impacts, the quantitative ones, uh, where we have different indicators and tools or instruments uh, we measure these impacts with, and also the qualitative ones, which are uh, more difficult to measure, but not less important than the previous ones. In the Luz Foundation that has been working for 98 years for the integral uh, or the integration of people with visual impairments, we have always wanted to have initiatives or tools that uh, improve the quality of life of our users. At the beginning of this implementation, we were focused uh, we had focused this uh, project in three main programs. First one, the labor inclusion program. Second, the rehabilitation program for adult people that uh, are blind, that did not have enough, the, a good rehabilitation from the beginning. And then a training program, which has three uh, subjects, which is a uh, uh, message uh, therapy, gastronomy, and administration. When we discovered the tool, we thought that it could also be possible to use it by to be used by children. So we thought about creating exercises would be that would be focused in children, and we also incorporated to this first in quantitative indicator that we had that was to train at least three professionals in technologies for blind people and in and in our program obviously and we also incorporated another professional who works in the santa lucia school which is a school from the foundation and with these we are four professionals 
who are learning about this uh, technology to pass it to the users. It can be the users of the three programs, which are rehabilitation, training, and labor inclusion, and also children. Among the impacts that we have in the short term or that we, what we need to measure, we see or we consider the training of 21 users in our program. This depends on the context of the stages that we are applying. And this should be finished uh, soon because we have also increased the amount of hours in order to reach the objective as soon as possible. We, are, we want to do more things, but out of these users, out of this, of this universe of users, a high percentage of them says that they, in a survey that we are going to uh, apply, they are even more ready to their employment uh, in comparison to how they felt at the beginning. Out of this universe of users, 75% of them they sh they show more efficiency with in the computer with computer computing skills and also technology and within the program of labor inclusion we have some companies that ask us for help in relation to the productivity of users they have uh, workers in some areas that may face some uh, problems and we are going to implement there the use of blind me that so they can improve their um, labor performance or work performance we are going to measure this with a registry of results and according to the context of these people and the problems they face out of this a sample of users that we can uh, train, they should a percentage of them should be able to pass a final exam in Blind Me. Also, we will create at least three exercises that show the need, a, la a labor need that is specific to our country. When we think about the uh, qualitative uh, impacts, we could say that this platform assures a self-learning in India. Among these apps, 90% of users feel much better when using computers and 80% of those users, according to the data provided in India, 80% feel much better prepared or trained for um, employment. I think this is, this is data that we can replicate and this goes along with the self-learning process of being autonomous, of uh, as what Henry said, the empowerment of being able to have access to the information, to the tools. In the past, we provided uh, basic tools that would allow people to train themselves for the educational and labor world. But now it's going to be easier because now we have uh, navigation tools that uh, we provide in a basic way and we can open this way and, and a door for those who want to start a self-learning process and are accountant for their own process and this helps them to have a better performance not only in the um, social level but in their self-esteem and they feel they are able to complete this process because because technology has been a great ally of inclusion and being able to handle this uh, technology opens the doors to the employment to the education uh, which are the great greatest milestones or the greatest objectives Thank you so much, Williams, for your intervention. I think it creates a great impact, this autonomy, this empowerment. 
And it's very good to see that we are moving towards that direction. I can tell you that I'm here sitting uh, with uh, Paloma Seed from Once Foundation. That's one of the advantages of being in presence here. But before starting with her, I'm going to start with Guillem Praga, so the CEO of Egalite, so he can tell us about the uh, measurement of the impact of this initiative. Thank you very much, Ingrid. It's very good to be here with you. Here at Egality, we believe that measuring impacts is extremely important when we look at our projects. Because that's what we're working for. We believe that the labor inclusion of people with disabilities is a fantastic opportunity for companies to see better outcomes. So we don't believe that it's just a social issue, but also something that's very important for all companies who want to achieve better growth. It's very important. Our project in Chile is with the National Employment Service. Primarily aims to bring a employment platform that is fully accessible for people with different types of disabilities. So we are developing, or we have been developing this technology over the past few years in Brazil. It's a project that was recognized by Zero Project and it was part of the ICT initiative. And so now we are bringing our technology to other countries. In Chile, as William said, we have quantitative and qualitative indicators that we're measuring. In terms of quantitative measures, they, they really refer to everything to do with recruitment. So the number of candidates that we have registered on our platform We'll take those numbers and we'll look at the demography of our the people registered, the types of disabilities, the region where they live. We think that knowing all of these aspects is very important so that we can really think about the strategy of our project. We're also measuring the amount of uh, applications to job opportunities. We have a registry of candidates and the job offers, and we have to look and see what are the most sought out opportunities. And that's because we want to know the number, the amount of labor inclusion that we have achieved. So we need to have those candidates that are on our platform understand and know who they are. And then we have the other side on the company side. We need to understand and have the greatest number of companies possible registered on our platform and the increase the number of opportunities that we have at hand. Then we also like to measure the retention rate of our candidates because one of the things that we believe when it comes to recruitment is that if the more information you have, the better inclusion you can have and the better retention rate you can achieve in terms of those candidates. So it is also very important to be able to measure that indicator. So one of the other objectives that we have is making sure that we follow our qualitative in indicators, which is we do through a survey that we carry out with companies and with our candidates to measure their, their satisfaction. We want to have very good numbers in terms of labor inclusion, but our objective is to make sure that we also have candidates 
who are well positioned in companies and that the companies have a very good satisfaction rate in terms of the types of jobs that are being covered. So our technology carries out a quality match between candidates and companies. That's one of the best uh, points of our, of our technology that we can offer. We face certain time constraints because it is a pilot project. And so we have a short amount of time to be able to achieve our objectives. So when you talk about impacts, we can't just look at the short term. We need to think about how all of these actions that we'll be carrying out can be applied over a longer time period. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you very much for your contribution. Now I'm going to pass things over to Paloma so that she can tell us about how they're measuring the impact of their project. She's the coordination uh, coordinator for the 3D project at Fundación Nonce. It's fantastic to be here right beside you, Ingrid, after so many years. Well, as with the other projects that we've talked about, we have gone through some of the indicators so that we can see how we are training professionals and the decisions that are being, ma being made. And so we also want indicators that show whether or not the people who begin their training continue with it and the knowledge that they've taken in terms of 3D printing and whether our outcomes are quality or no. So some of the indicators that we've looked at are those related to the real impact of people in these job posts. We need more time, the truth is, to be able to truly evaluate these indicators. But in terms of the number of job posts, we look at the satisfaction as well, uh, just as Guillermo did. Today, it's not possible to really measure things because we have yet to finish our training program and the project needs some more time to mature. However, and these are indicators that we didn't think of at, uh, at first, but I think there's a few things that are leading us to believe that our final impact is going to be relatively large. The first indicator of that is that our project that we're carrying out with INRPAC has had a really high level of commitment, which shows that they have decided to dedicate even more time so that they can continue to investigate, continue to develop and continue to research what they're doing. So we know that they're going to really take full advantage of all of the skills that they're acquiring. Another indicator that seems to be really important is the number of ideas that we have generated just through training 3D printing skills to this team. In terms of the materials, how they design, they've had all these incredible ideas and they've been able to develop a great number of ideas that now they want to put into practice. But I think Ingrid can tell us a bit more about some of these indicators. I think she's seen some of the impacts that they have because I think you were there with INR Park recently, no? Yes, we were there two weeks ago with Pacto de Productiva in Chile, and we went to INR Park so that we could converse with them and see what the team was doing and uh, ask them how the knowledge transfer was going. And they were very happy with everything. And one of the things that we saw that, that relates to what we're talking about, uh, that has to do more with the quality of impacts, are the effects and social benefits that we're seeing in terms of the devices that they're developing for people with disabilities. So it's having an impact on their quality of life that goes beyond some, something that we can analyze in the short term. So I think that visit has allowed us to see how the project is developing and we'd like to send them a, a greeting because we know that they weren't able to be here today. But one of the last questions that we'd like to talk about is 
the impacts and how you uh, imagine these projects can be scaled up in other areas, if, for example, throughout Latin America. I think it's completely repl replicable because we were able to apply this during the pandemic. So I think being able to replicate it in other locations is more than possible. I'd also like to say that the team that we've worked with as they mature and they build confidence, I think there are a lot of practical applications, but I think also they will be able to carry out their knowledge and transfer it to other people. So I think all of our relations with the INR pack, we, what we would like to see is that they then begin to train further professionals, but I think it would be more than possible that, to replicate these efforts in other institutions, in other cities, and little by little, I think we can expand it beyond where it is today. I think we need to establish more public-private alliances so that we can guarantee the resources, not just in terms of materials and the 3D printers, because it, it, we need to make sure that we maintain those resources, the job positions that are available. And I think one of the best ways to do is to build those alliances with projects that would allow us to self-finance these developments, maybe establishing training courses or and funds so that we can continue to finance this project. But I think that it will be able to be replicated and I think it will be a great success. Thank you. I think that what you're saying is very important because we have to try out the solution in Chile and then see what conditions do we need to establish to be able to expand it. I think if we go to Williams now, we could see what do you see, whether or not your project can be replicated in other areas. How do you envision the future of your project? I understand that it's very different than our own, but do you of course, in order to, to, to answer this question, I had to dream a little bit about this and I had to find out about something about this and see what happens in the Latin American uh, context uh, where we have some limitations about the data collection. But I can tell you that in 2016, in a compilation of the Ministry of uh, the Social Ministry of uh, Development in Chile, we estimate that or they estimated that out of 15 million people in Chile, and I think uh, the, the current population in Chile should be 16 million in Chile, and there were in that time 11.9% uh, of people who were uh, disabled. And when we saw the compilation of the World Bank of 2021, they said there was about 13% uh, of people with uh, visual um, disabilities, and that should be about uh, 10, more than 10 million people. So it's a lot of people. In order to cover or to address them, we've been working with Enable India in order to maintain this work, to continue working, and we are going to be responsible uh, for this project in Spanish as Fundación Luz or Luz Foundation, and, and we will have to train more organizations that would use this tool, and hopefully this tool is a standard among bl uh, blind uh, people, and we could provide it with more features that would benefit this community. And also we want to work in the quality of the material of new exercises that would represent the context of the different countries and the different situations people may live. Considering that this uh, path of inclusion is something that we have to build together, we cannot wait for others to change our reality. And I can tell you this as a disabled person, if I can empower myself, if I can be part of the changes, I have to do them for my own uh, good and the community of, 
I belong to. And that's why I'm very happy because of uh, about these initiatives. I wanted to share with you these uh, final words. We've been working a lot and we've been working with uh, this Enable project in India to have this relationship in the long term. And this is um, useful for the people that I've just mentioned. Thank you so much, Williams, for your commitment that we have seen from the very first moment. We are convinced that this project it belongs to all of us and inclusion is for all of us. And let's ask now to Guillaume, how do you dream about, what's your dream about this replication of Egalité? Please tell us about it. Our intention is to use our technology all over the world. And it not only of egalitas technology, but we think, we believe there are a lot of initiatives that work with the labor inclusion for people with disabilities all around the world. Our goal is that it is possible to amplify the work of all these initiatives. So our intention is to have more technology and more impact. We believe that Egalité has a flexible technology that is um, can be customized to the different countries, to the different languages. We also have the Spanish that is used in Chile, so it's easier to think about other countries in Latin America and around the world. For us, it is very important. Uh, we consider this project in Chile is something that is very important that hopefully it's successfully and we are also working with the National Employment Service uh, partners because we want the continuity of this project. We do not want to have this project uh, running only for 10 months, but we want it to run for many years. And we think that it, this is a good opportunity to have a case in Latin America so we can think about the replication of this case in other countries. Thank you so much, Guillermo. As, as you said, it's very important that the social partner, the National Employment Service, provides the conditions to give a continuity to this great project and bring this initiative to other countries. Now we are going to close our uh, meeting. We, I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank Henry, Alejandra, Williams, Guillermo, and Paloma, who is here with me. I'm so delighted to share with her this uh, moment. And we want to continue working together so this initiative can be seen in the labor inclusion for people with disabilities. Thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you soon in presence. Thank you very much.